this Georgia as heavy as I was. It's called acanthosis. 18 plus percent of our children right now are obese. How loud are you? About 280. If you go with the flow in America today, you will end up overweight or obese, as two thirds of Americans do. I don't want to be fat for the rest of my life. I've got diabetes. Sleep apnea. High blood pressure. I get dizzy when I get up. Everything's hurting now. You don't crave broccoli, and our generation has grown up craving a Big Mac. We have built a cheap food model, and that's the one we're dealing with right now. It's so hard to combat against what the TV's telling you to buy your kids. The kind of food that we eat is the kind that's most profitable. Local and regional foods taste better. The weight of the nation is out of control, but we can fix that. How do you like the market? Market means everything for this neighborhood. We have got to come together as a country and really make this a priority. As long as we stick together, that's what it's about. It's not only health, it's about survival and well-being of the United States as a nation. The reason we have government in the first place is to solve problems collectively that we can't solve individually. If we don't now take this as a really serious, urgent national priority, we are all of us individually and as a nation going to pay a really serious price. I weighed 99 pounds when my husband and I got married 30 years ago. Then you start having a family, and after my second child, it was like poof, and it was my, my grandmother, my mother, my sister, and myself. We've got, it's been the same story. It's not easy to take weight off. And that's liposuction, patches, peels, fad diets, counting carbs, counting calories. I've tried it all. And I've asked my husband, let's be honest here, am I that big? And when he doesn't answer me, I think, oh my God, what has happened to me? You know, or if he says, no way, then I feel better about myself, you know, but the ones that, that he don't answer, I know I'm that big. And it's, it's, it's like a slap in the face, wake up, you know, do something. You try and it doesn't, and you, you lose hope then. It's just like any town throughout the southeastern United States. And there's some variations. You get rural in northern Mississippi. There's really a lot of poverty and so forth. And it partly relates to the industry and agriculture. But we're just like any old 
country town. It's strawberries and cheese and no, what, it's not strawberry. It's strawberry jello, and yeah. it's got bananas and pineapple, and you would not believe how good it is. Get your plates, start eating. This is Louisiana cooking. This is Louisiana at its best. Where's the shrimp pasta? You get tired of the, the diet that, that's not going to work, and then you, you fall off the wagon, so to speak, and... You know, you, then you really pig out on something you're not supposed to have. <laughs> or, you know, you get tired of that, that feeling of, of failure. If you don't fry it, you grill it. If you don't grill it, you boil it. That's the way we eat down here. What's the name? Cindy and Gary Roach. Cindy, you're going to be first. Gary's going to be second. Okay. And Just have a seat. When did you start coming to the hard study? Oh, okay. We were in grammar school. In grammar Both school. Both of us. Were. I want to say about the third grade. Third, fourth, fifth third, grade. Fourth oh, grade. Yeah. Kathy Pike. Kathy, when did you start coming through screening? I started heart study, um, my first year was in 1973. I was in kindergarten. The Bogalusa Heart Study is a landmark investigation of the, uh, the genesis of cardiovascular disease from childhood right through adulthood. And many of us, as we came up through our biomedical sciences in uh, undergraduate university, we learned about the Bogalusa Heart Study. The main focus is on cardiovascular disease and the pathogenesis of disease over, over time, really starting in childhood. I'm going home, home to Bogalusa. I'm going home, home to Bogalusa. a heart study, we're looking at risk factors in children. Since we want to look at the early natural history, it's obvious that we ought to look at the early onset of these diseases. The major effect of the Bogalusa Heart Study is the biannual general examination of all school children in Bogalusa. I can remember being very excited when they used to come to the school, they used to come, it was a big white trailer. And that's where they did all of the, um, all of your work. And back then I was just happy because we were getting out of class. When I got the heart study, the intention was to look at risk factors, just like Framingham, but to do it in children. What I need is a list of the people that you don't have any kind of record on. Some of them we have because we knew the cause, we just didn't have the death certificate. So you've exhausted all the data from the coroner's office. Yes, sir, we have After we had been in the study five or six years, we clearly established that heart disease began in childhood. What clinched our information was doing an autopsy study. Five hundred and sixty deaths since nineteen seventy two. When we began to see lesions in kids, it really gelled the fact that looking at risk factors clinically in life and here looking at the actual vascular disease in death and having a strong correlation, highly significant relationships. I take a breath. Our children are now 50 years old, and we have a 30, 35 year history on them. Did you give us your email address? It's the only study like that in the world that has long term black white population. The obesity that we're seeing 
is very damaging to the cardiovascular system. I just found out that I have high blood pressure. And they said that I was on the borderline with maybe uh, diabetes. So my doctor told me to do to go brown. So no more white rice or potatoes or white bread. So we've gone to like wheat pasta, wheat bread, that type of thing. Okay. All right. What did you get for the subscapula? 132.9. Another hug. And 133. Obesity is not just fat cells sitting there, but the, particularly the central fat, the abdominal fat, the, the android deposition, the male deposition of fat, the waist measurement. This is to measure the abdomen. But it's the obesity which is the major driving force for insulin resistance. Insulin resistance and obesity are the driving force for hypertension, diabetes. Okay, thank you. The blood pressure was... 140 know. over is high. If you lost 20 pounds, it might go to normal. Well, I am working on that. I've lost you ought to be on some medicine. I don't care. You ought to be on some medicine. I'll go back and see a doctor. That's good. Hey, Sandy. How are you? I'm fine. Mm -hmm. You doing okay, Miss Rita? I'm doing fine. Found you ready for this? this morning? I found out through heart study I had high blood pressure. And I can take that to the doctor. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. That's all we need. My grandmother had a heart attack. Both my grandmothers. I'm sorry. Um, but I know going through heart study that if something is wrong, it's going to be caught early on. And maybe I'll be here to see my grandkids grow up. I've got to learn to eat the right things at the right times. And I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna give it a shot. And come back and y'all see maybe a new me. <laughs> Life is really hard for people who are obese. And by hard, I mean both the social consequences of that and the health consequences of that. Um, right down to the fact that those who are very obese are not gonna live as long as others. Um, what makes me frustrated, bordering on angry, is that um, this is preventable. Uh, it's not, this is not one of those unfortunate acts of nature that we just have to accept as reality. This is not the product of a tsunami. The weight of the nation is not healthy. And to get it healthy, we're all going to have to do our part. All of us have to be part of the solution to reduce obesity in this country. Otherwise, we're going to be faced with steadily increasing healthcare costs and the lives that are lost from cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and other problems. How many people in this society are able to maintain a healthy weight? A third or less? Something's wrong with this picture. Levels of obesity in the United States have increased in alarming ways. In the 1980s, the Centers for Disease Control began putting together a map showing levels of obesity state by state, and then they went through the years. And every time a state changes colors, it suggests increasing levels of obesity. When you look at the rates of adult obesity from 1960 until 2008, you can see that the rates were moderate and relatively consistent over time. But then starting in the 1980s, we saw a rapid increase resulting in the current level, which is fully over a third of adult men and women in the United States are obese. But it's the morbid obesity where we've seen the most striking increase from 1988 until 2008. 
We have childhood obesity at levels where people aren't denying it anymore. So it is a teachable moment when it was only adults or only people in less valued groups. You could put it aside, it's those people. But when it's children, you can get a conversation going. People who are poorer tend to have higher rates of obesity. So if you look back in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there's a linear relationship between poverty and obesity. But if you look more recently, from 2005 to 2008, everybody's rates have gone up. And being wealthier is not nearly as protective against obesity as it used to be. There is some regional variation, but it's all different degrees of terrible. The levels are so high everywhere that every state has to pay attention to this issue. The health care costs, not to mention the human burden, are very high in every corner of this country and increasingly every corner of the world. Obesity is an enormously complex problem uh, with inputs uh, from several places. Genetics is one. Uh, we know uh, that about 60 to 70 percent of the risks of obesity are heritable ones. When it comes to obesity, for the vast majority of people, there's no one gene that makes a difference. There's many, many genes, dozens, perhaps hundreds, each of which has a small effect on the obesity in the population, but which add up to a susceptibility when exposed to this environment we live in for getting more overweight or not. There are a large number of genes that have been identified in humans that do play a role in the control of body weight. And very interestingly, the majority of these genes are genes that influence food intake. Obesity is a classic example of a, what we call a gene by environment interaction. Any individual's body weight, in most instances, is a result of the interaction of their genetic makeup with the environment that they happen to be living in. There's no doubt that genetics, the DNA that we inherit from our parents, affects how much we weigh. There's also no doubt that the environment we live in affects how much we weigh. There's no nature versus nurture. There's nature and nurture. Both nature, by that we mean genes, and nurture, we mean experience, affect each other, and they're inextricably intertwined. Is there a genetic predisposition to obesity? Absolutely. Is obesity caused by environment and behavior? Absolutely. been interested in obesity for a long time, but now we're responsible for a city of 8.3 million people. Every one of those people I consider to be my patient as a doctor. Um, and of all the health problems I deal with, this is the one problem that's getting worse, uh, obesity and diabetes. This shows the diabetes and the obesity in the South Bronx here. The, uh, the lowest income county in New York State, very high prevalence of obesity, very high rates of diabetes. Just a short distance away here in Manhattan, in the Upper East Side, where it's uh, the highest income neighborhood in the city, uh, we have very low prevalence of obesity, very low prevalence of diabetes. Obesity is driving the epidemic of diabetes. darkest areas on this map, close to 90% of adults are overweight or obese. 
you do have to literally start connecting some of these dots. You know, 57% of the kids in Philadelphia are overweight or obese. You want to play, Brian? Okay. We have serious diabetes problems, uh, obesity, uh, especially with our children, uh, and uh, they just need more options right here in the community, right on the avenue. We already know, based on the information from the Center for Disease Control and many others, that for uh, kids living in these neighborhoods, many of them will die before their parents. A child born in 2000 has a one in three lifetime chance of having diabetes. If that child is African American or Latino, it's one in two. The red spots are where the highest rates of poverty are. In this area, almost one out of every three children is considered to be overweight or uh, obese. And this is an area, as you were saying, with poverty, the average household income is less than $25,000 for a family of four. If you look at the state of Tennessee in Nashville, it is a crisis level here. I mean, we rank at the bottom. If we don't take on strategies that affect how the low-income community is dealing with the obesity epidemic, we're going to see this phenomenon across our society in a relatively short period of time. right now, which I'm sure was really nice back in the, the 60s or 70s. And up here on the left is the lumber mill. The smell of the lumber mill kind of permeates this whole place. That's one of the lingering memories. When I first left Louisiana, people begged me not to go. I think a really important question is you know, when we look at the the levels of overweight and obesity that we're seeing in, in Bogalusa, you know, 50% of kids um, being overweight or obese. Is, is Bogalusa unusual? Or if we looked at other places like this around the country, would we be seeing similar levels of overweight and obesity? You know, is Bogalusa special or do we just happen to, to have you know, 35 years of data on it? In the 1970s, 5% of children were overweight and obese. Today, that's over 30%. So we've seen just dramatic increases in a very short period of time. So our biology has changed quite rapidly within a very short time frame on the evolutionary time scale. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have produced these maps. And this area around the lower Mississippi Delta, encompassing Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, historically has the highest prevalence of obesity and is kind of at the forefront of the obesity epidemic in the United States. Hold this pink one for me. Actually, Brian, come on in here and let's get your height and weight. Okay. You ready, Dean? So you're 12? 
Yes, I've been here 10 years and I have seen a drastic change in the obesity and I've seen um, a change in the blood pressures. It's definitely going up. Their blood pressure should not be that high. Actually, it should never be over 120 over 80. So this is this is a kid that we'll watch. We'll monitor his pressure. We will probably do lab work on him, get an EKG, make sure everything with his heart's okay, send him to cardiology. If that comes back clean, we may send him to see um, a kidney specialist to make sure there's nothing going on with the kidneys because that sometimes can cause blood pressures to go up. So this will be a kid that we watch and we follow. Okay. Step up on the scale. We have to address it now. These are going to be our patients that have are on dialysis in their 30s if we don't do something now. They're our future. They need us. They need us to care. And we do. We as pediatricians never had to worry about learning a lot about hypertension. That was a specialist disease. We sent the occasional one to the cardiologist. But now there'll be many, many times that I'll be facing children with increased blood pressure. Stacy, give you a note going back to class, OK? I think the results that we're showing in Bogalusa may be reflective as to where the country is going. The blue line is the national data, and the red line shows the Bogalusa. By the mid-1980s, Bogalusa really began outstripping the pace of the rest of the country. We don't really see ethnic disparities. We see that both African-American and white children have comparable levels of overweight and obesity. This is it. This is what the kids have. The swings are broken down. There's no basketball court for them to play on. And I mean, what does a parent do? You know, what voice do they have in demanding safer play spaces for their kids? And this is actually, we're in a part of town with higher poverty rates. And the density of kids is actually one of the higher areas in Bogalusa. I guess, you know, we as communities need to realize that, that these features of our environment have health consequences and have consequences for, for the obesity epidemic. It has to be a complete community, entire society approach to reducing this complex problem. Not only is the prevalence of overweight and obesity going up, in other words, more and more children are classified as overweight or obese, but within that category, those children are becoming heavier and heavier. Around the world, obesity rates continue to climb, so I don't think we've reached the maximum yet. One of the most important ways we've learned about cardiovascular health and what a normal heart and vessel system looks like, as well as how disease process develops across the lifespan in the cardiovascular system, is by studying tissue from autopsy specimens in people who have died for completely different reasons, but also in people who have died related to cardiovascular causes. Weight that's present in young adulthood and weight that is gained from young adulthood to middle age has tremendous consequences. So we really think of this as a perfect storm, a hurricane of consequences that drive cardiovascular risk. And what we have in this case, this is the heart from a 26-year-old woman of normal size, height, and weight, who died of a non-cardiac cause. Her, her cardiovascular system was entirely normal. Now, in contrast, we have a heart from another individual, in this case, a male. He was in his 50s, he weighed 500 pounds, and he was 5'9 in height. His BMI was calculated to be 70. Yeah. Over 30 is, is obese. It's really dramatically different from the normal heart. You can see here there's a lot of fat. The cavity is a little bit small, and the wall thickness is extreme. It's more than a centimeter and a half. So this heart had to do a lot more 
vigorous pumping to push around a larger amount of blood volume and also was pumping into a thicker, stiffer arterial bed. So it had to beef up the muscle in order to compensate for that. So this is hypertrophy. Pretty quickly, that heart muscle that thickens so dramatically can actually start to weaken. So the cells go through changes. Uh, they pass a sort of tipping point where they then become weaker and the heart overall starts to dilate or enlarge. And that ultimately can lead to heart failure. So at here, we see the thickened wall in a very small cavity, but this individual died of a heart attack. The contrast here is a woman who has thickened walls as well, but she didn't have a heart attack. And over time, those thickened walls got weaker and weaker, and the heart got bigger and bigger and dilated to the point where she had this big, baggy, ineffective pump. Now, the heart's a muscle like any other muscle in your body with one important difference. It never gets to rest. So the heart is particularly dependent on its continuous blood supply. And if that blood supply gets interrupted, such as in a heart attack, there's damage to the heart muscle that starts to occur within seconds to minutes. And so in the end, with the patient's death, the pathologist sees. This is a 71-year-old woman who weighed about 260 pounds. You can see here that it's enlarged. It also has a fair amount of fat on the epicardial surface of the heart. This patient has had a bypass operation. We can see the bypass grafts laying on the surface of the heart. So this woman, as a result of her obesity, developed atherosclerosis and required coronary artery bypass. And that's the graft that you see here that was done sometime before her death. You can imagine as a plaque forms in an artery, it will affect the dynamics of that artery. Normally an artery is composed of smooth muscle cells that actually expand to accept blood when the heart is pumping and then contract to push it forward to the rest of the tissue that's downstream. Over time, when plaques start to build up, there's more ingrowth of tissue and severe limitation to blood flow. And that may cause symptoms like angina or chest pain when someone is exerting themselves. So when a plaque forms, that plaque may gradually enlarge over time. And if too much blood clot forms, it completely blocks the artery. Once that happens, almost instantaneously, the heart muscle cells downstream will start to die. Now, the blue vessels that you see are actually veins which are bringing blood back to the heart, and the red vessels coming out are arteries. This is the aorta, which carries oxygenated fresh blood to the rest of the body tissues. This is our aorta from our 26-year-old. She has a normal heart and a relatively normal aorta. But if we look very closely, you see a little bit of yellow raised lesion here, here, here. Fatty streaks are among the earliest lesions, and they occur in children. Between the ages of 5 and 10, we think this process begins. Those early life experiences, the development of obesity and overweight at a very young age, we know has major consequences much earlier than, than we should see uh, for the arteries in particular. This is an aorta from our 71-year-old woman, and you can see that this is a lot more complicated. The surface is very rough, and in fact, this aorta is, is crunchy. It's calcified, it's hard, it's stiff. And some of these lesions, these plaques, have ruptured, exposing the lipid to the bloodstream. And when you see this kind of disease in the, in the aorta, you know it's present in other vessels as well. So ideal cardiovascular health is really defined by seven factors in health behaviors, and they include having optimal levels of total cholesterol, a normal blood pressure, not having diabetes, having a lean body mass index, meaning you're not obese or overweight, not being a smoker, and participating in recommended levels of physical activity, as well as pursuing a healthy diet. Unfortunately, at present in the United States, less than 1% of individuals actually meet the definition for all seven of these criteria for ideal cardiovascular health. Last February, I was um, training for the Country Music Half Marathon. I had reached 10 miles, and I was going to do 12 that day. And I started to feel really nauseous and lightheaded, and my legs started to fail, and it was a heart attack. This is me on my wedding day. I'm at my heaviest. You can see by the look in my eye how I feel. I remember feeling ashamed. I weighed 400 pounds. I've lost uh, 100 plus pounds since this day. 
I play a very wind-driven instrument. It's a very physical instrument. And I noticed changes in my playing. My weight affected my musicianship. You know how people say they look at a photograph of the way they were and they say, I never want to go back to being that guy. I don't believe that. I think I am that guy, but I'm taking care of that guy now. You can change, even if you weigh uh, like 400 pounds, you can change. It boils down to a decision and saying, this is what will happen. It's not a matter of saying, I want to or I would like to, it is what will be. And that kind of decision and that kind of fortitude changes things. individual with the abdominally preponderant fat, if you will, is at higher risk for the complications of obesity, meaning diabetes, high blood pressure, heart attack, than an individual who has fat stored elsewhere. There are health consequences associated with fat deposition, specifically within the belly. We now know that there are um, hormones that are released from these fat cells that then could interact, for example, with your heart or with your pancreas, and they may become detrimental. This person, as you can see, where white is body fat, has a thick rim of fat underneath their skin called subcutaneous fat. This person also has a lot of fat inside of their abdomen you can see all of these white blotches here inside the belly. Almost every organ system in the body is adversely affected by having excess body fat. And this is excess body fat underneath your skin, excess body fat inside your abdomen, and excess fat inside of other organs like liver tissue and muscle tissue and heart tissue affects the function of those organs. All of us have fat inside our, our tummy. We have to have a little bit because we actually mobilize that fat every night when we're fasting while we're asleep. That's the fat that is metabolized and turned into the fuel supply to keep our brain happy while we're asleep until we have our breakfast. Evolutionarily, men and women have been programmed to deposit fat into two different fat depots. We have the visceral depot, which is this depot of fat that's located inside the abdominal wall. It's the first fat depot that is readily mobilizable, and it's, it's burned up very, very quickly. And so men who needed to go out and actually find the game or the bear or, or the, the food for the family, they needed to be able to have a calorie substrate that, that was able to burn up really, really quickly to provide them some energy. Women, on the other hand, we fight against losing weight in our hips and thighs. And the reason we're programmed that way is that we rely on the calories in our hips and thighs evolutionarily to provide us with calories for breastfeeding um, or to help sustain a, a potential famine while we're pregnant. Now that's all in evolutionary terms. In the modern world, of course, we're all living with excess energy supplies and therefore both males and females store that fat inside their abdomen, inside their muscle, inside their liver, and under the skin. And all of a sudden, the system which was elegantly designed now no longer is necessarily advantageous for the species. 